We are very lucky to have with us live in the studios this morning, Martin Fleck and Dave Hall. Martin Fleck is the former coordinator of the Campaign for a Nuclear-Free World, former executive director of Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility, and former chair of the Northwest Disarmament Coalition. Dr. Dave Hall is a board member with Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility, past president of Physicians for Social Responsibility, and a board member with the Ground Zero Center for Nonviolent Action. And they are both in this morning to talk about nuclear weapons, the START Treaty, and uh, Washington State's role in all of that. So, uh, Martin and Dave, thank you very much for coming in and spending time with us this morning. It's a pleasure. Great to be here. So let's uh, start out, and uh, I, I failed to note that there was a premiere in Seattle last night of an important groundbreaking film, Countdown to Zero. Uh, you both attended that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Countdown to Zero is a, a new attempt by the producers of An Inconvenient Truth uh, to uh, bring again to a much broader public audience, the issue of nuclear weapons in 2010. Uh, and uh, we had a chance to see it for the first time and uh, found it to be a very, very interesting, disturbing film, uh, talking about the realities of, of what uh, the nuclear threat looks like in 2010. I'm always interested to hear um, when I go to see a film, um, when when I find out that it's based on a true story, I always find films more compelling when they're based on a true story because I think that what really goes on in this world is very interesting. So here's a film that's a documentary um, completely based on a true story, sordid, frightening, but true. Uh, and um, I, I think that director Lucy Walker did a really great job of um, making this uh, somewhat complex and, and frightening issue accessible to folks so that you can understand it. It's very artistically done film for you know for a documentary i was very impressed with how watchable it was and as you told me uh, just moments ago the i guess the real uh uh metal there is that somebody walked away and said you know i'm gonna have nightmares tonight which is what one should have when they know the truth about this yeah at some level that's exactly what what happens understanding just uh how much of a hair thread holds us between uh, the daily safety that we take for granted uh, and whole cities uh, disintegrating, uh, being incinerated. Uh, so it's, it's telling us uh, as a story that uh, hopefully people will, will come to see, because it's a very important issue, uh, come to understand it, and then stand up and say, it's time to uh, eliminate nuclear weapons. Uh, that's countdown to zero. It's countdown to zero nuclear weapons throughout the world. We can't wait. Um, that's the thing. That there's a lot going on. That Lord knows, with what went on in the Gulf of Mexico recently, and what with the economic um, crisis being the way it is. I mean, there's there's plenty of reasons for Americans to be concerned about a plethora of issues. However, this is one that's sort of like on the back burner and people aren't paying a lot of attention to it, the nuclear weapons issue, but they will. I mean, if one of these goes off somewhere, anywhere in the world, the third nuclear weapon to destroy a city, uh, I guarantee you there'll be a massive amount of attention, but it's, it's too late. I, mean, I think it's incumbent upon us to deal with this issue without the emergency having happened and, and shown up on CNN of some city in flames. So. That's why I'm grateful to participant media uh, and the um, Global Zero people for producing this film because it's really vital that folks know this is going on so that they're in a position to prevent it from happening. Um, because we really, really, it would be irresponsible and I'd say immature to simply wait uh, until some horrible, horrible uh, catastrophe happens and we all see it on TV and then we get all upset about it. Dave and I, we've already, the movie won't give us additional nightmares. We've already had our nightmares about this. I've been doing this for decades. <laughs> we've, we've, we, you know, it's sort of like, welcome to my nightmare, you know. Uh, so there's nothing shocking or it, it didn't send, send me home with any additional um, fright. But, but I, I think it's a, a very, it's very valuable for, um, you know, Americans should be aware of what's going on with our, with our tax money. 
and what's going on with our policies. And um, I think that this this film um, is very helpful. It's very helpful at this juncture. It's at, it's at the Varsity Theater in the University District. I think it's going to play three or four times a day for the next week or more. Uh, so it's, it's something people should go and see. The, the, the film builds on uh, what's, what's become the consequence of 9-11 of in thinking about national security. Uh, basically, uh, through the 80s until the collapse of the Soviet Union, we had mutual assured destruction, the United States and the Soviet Union facing off with enormous uh, arsenals of nuclear weapons, uh, essentially guaranteeing that if either side fired, both sides are going to be completely obliterated. But with the advent of terrorists uh, willing to die in the process of taking their revenge, uh, there's no territory to retaliate against, uh, so there's no mutual uh, assured destruction. It's, uh, it's basically anybody that gets hold of the materials that are necessary, the fissile materials that uh, it takes to make a nuclear weapon, can make a nuclear weapon that they can smuggle into a city or any other place. Uh, and so that changes the game. Uh, the big arsenals don't work anymore. What has to happen is all the fissile materials need an international uh, alliance to keep them safe, to keep them out of the hands of people that might actually want to use them. And that's, that's the changing game, that it's a cooperative security now, not a security of threatening your, your enemy. However, the, the old um, regime, nuclear weapons regime, still exists. We still have both the U.S. and the Soviet Union, amongst others, having thousands of warheads pointed at each other. Can you give us the, the big picture and then also tie in Washington State's role in all of this? Yeah, the United States and Russia is still have the vast majority of all the nuclear weapons in the world, 95 percent of them or more. Uh, and right here, uh, just 20 miles from Seattle on Hood Canal at uh, Naval Base Kitsap Banger, where the Triton submarines are home ported, we have the largest single concentration of weapons of mass destruction anywhere, perhaps in the world, certainly anywhere outside of Russia, uh, just right here uh, in our backyard. And we also have the Hanford Reservation, which is where the plutonium for the uh, Trinity and Nagasaki bombs uh, was made. Uh, and it's still the largest Superfund site uh, anywhere in the Western Hemisphere. And that's a consequence of building these weapons uh, right over here in eastern Washington. So we have, in the state of Washington, uh, both ends of the problem here. We have the production uh, disasters in terms of the environmental disasters, and we have the actual uh, war-making machines. We have the, the most powerful, uh, deadly warships in the world in the Trident submarines. And um, as you find out in the film, there's still over 23,000 nuclear weapons in the world. And uh, in Countdown to Zero, they go through um, the his history of each nation getting the, the weapon. It's, it's, there's some amusing parts in the, in the film because they're, they went and did interviews all over the world, and they asked people, how many nuclear weapons do you think there are? You know, some people said, oh, wow, there might be 100. You know, um, and it's hard to know. How do you know? It's it's not in the news. It's, this is not a big topic of conversation. But the fact of the matter is, there's over 23,000 nuclear weapons, and there's quite a few nations now that people may or may not be aware even have nuclear weapons, such as Israel, Pakistan, India, China, and um, North Korea. North Korea has detonated a few nuclear weapons now. Uh, and that's part. That's the dynamic that we're dealing with. You know, there, you, you were talking about the 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 legacy of the Cold War is the United States and the Soviet Union, ha or in the United States and Russia. Excuse me. You have these thousands and thousands of nuclear weapons, but the dynamic now, and I think part of the um, part of the motivation for this film and this new movement, uh, and and some of what Obama is doing, is that these nuclear weapons are now spreading and th what's t the trend is for them to continue to, to to spread and when you uh you know you challenge a, a nation like iran stop making nuclear weapons well iran is is um constrained by the non-proliferation treaty that it's a signatory to however in the non-proliferation treaty the nations that have nuclear weapons 
promised in 1970 that they would pursue general and complete disarmament of their nuclear weapons. And so I'm afraid that, you know, our policy is is leading to the spread of nuclear weapons because, we, you know, there's, there's frankly a, a, a frightening quote in there where Akhmanijad is, is uh, interviewed and he's saying, well, if these weapons are, you know, if you have them, then you must think they're good. And if they're bad, then why do you have them? You know, and if they're good, why shouldn't we have them? And, and, so, you know, it's, there's a hypocrisy here. I think it would be very good for um, Americans to to realize what our policy does and how, if we're concerned about how dangerous the world is, and it certainly is, and you'll find out in this movie, it's dangerous in ways that you didn't even know, okay, but our policies are leading to this danger that then comes back, comes back at us, and there's things we can do about it. You know, these are, these are, this is our tax money at work, these are our policies, and they're ma making us more insecure. But there's plenty of things that we can do that will make us more secure if we would just get on it. The, the next big issue coming up is this new START treaty with Russia, which is uh, a major step in reducing the nuclear arsenals on both sides. And virtually the entire uh, military command is saying, yes, we need this. And in particular, uh, we need this because it allows for much more uh, secure inspections of uh, the, the Russian facilities and a great deal of the concern about loose nuclear materials is from the old Soviet Union. The security of, of the fissile materials of the highly enriched uranium and the plutonium stockpiles in the former Soviet Union are not well secured and most all of the efforts uh, at trying to stop smuggling of this materials uh, have been intercepted in uh, the old Soviet Union or coming out of the old Soviet Union. So one of the things is to make sure we have a START treaty that allows us to work with Russia to secure those materials. Without the START treaty, we don't have a clue what's going on and it becomes much more dangerous there. And especially with all the treaties that during the former uh, Bush administration the U.S. backed out of or basically um, nullified this appears to be a a, a restart towards entering and honoring these nuclear based treaties it is and it uh, it's in a a context where we've had a number of treaties you know throughout the time with the Soviet Union and what's interesting is that those treaties have been honored on both sides uh, even though they've not necessarily been ratified either by the Duma or by the United States Congress uh, both countries have uh, have lived by the restrictions in the first start treaties for example uh, so that there is a reason to believe that these treaties in fact do make a difference that they are honored uh, in this context and the good news and in, in the big picture the good news is that the trend now uh, is returning more to normalcy uh, in the United States policy towards treaties, towards nuclear weapons, um, towards how we look at the rest of the world. And this is this really is a good development and a good trend that we should be encouraging. Um, in particular, the um, Obama twice has has said that the United States is now going to pursue a policy that would lead to a nuclear weapons free world. Well, you know, he and he has said this may not happen in my lifetime, but I I think it's the right thing to do and we should do it. And he's I think he's put himself on the line somewhat about this. He did a security council meeting uh, about disarmament. It's the first one I've ever heard of. United States I, I was very proud the United States was was essentially calling this meeting at the United Nations to talk about this this weighty issue, uh, and now you know he he has negotiated this START treaty, which frankly is long overdue to be um, renewed, and um, he negotiated that with um, Medvedev, and now it's going to be before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee next week. Now, there's some issues in the Senate of the United States, which I'm sure most of your listeners are aware of. We're having a hard time getting things passed in the United States Senate these days, to get a treaty ratified, we need a two-thirds majority of the United States Senate. Well, that's going to require bipartisanship like we haven't been seeing. And so uh, it's important, it's really important that the senators realize that there's, you know, History is hanging in the balance here. In the event that the United States chooses not to ratify this START treaty, well, I think that we're going to be going back 
we're going to be going back to the old <laughs> the old era of somewhat lawlessness or or disdain for you know there's going to be this image in the world that the United States could care less about the rest of the world and that becomes much much more dangerous for us because that's then a strong invitation for folks like al qaeda uh, to come after us uh, and be more aggressive. There's just no question that there are efforts out there to try to gain access to a nuclear weapon as a way of influencing the United States uh, so that if we don't have cooperative security, if we don't figure out how to work together with uh, the rest of the countries of the world to keep these materials safe, the rest of the organized, civilized uh, nations of the world, uh, then the rogue, the rogue elements uh, are going to have much more free hand. But if we do the right thing, and I think we will, I think the United States will ratify the START Treaty, um, and that will lower the deployed warheads on either side to 1,500 nuclear weapons and the deployed delivery vehicles to 700. Well, you know what? Those are large numbers. <laughs> but it's still moving in the right direction. I mean, obviously, we could end the world, no problem, with those kind of weapons. So we have to keep moving. And the rest of the world is waiting for the United States and Russia to get on board the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Now, if we can, you know, I've, I've been working for the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty my entire adult life. Uh, the Senate rejected it in 1999. Meanwhile, the rest of the world continues to put out um, seismic monitoring stations, build everything that they need to build. Ma many nations have signed on. Most nations in the world have signed on and ratified the Comprehensive Taste Ban Treaty. But they're waiting. There's 44 key nations that have to do it. The United States has really got to do it. Obama has made a commitment that he's going to get this done while he's president. I, I just want your listeners to be aware of that. This is not going to be trivial. If we get the Comprehensive Taste Ban Treaty, um, ratified by the United States and it goes into effect, then that is basically the world telling the next generation, you know what, we're done with this nuclear weapon stuff. We're not going to test them anymore because we realize that we got onto the wrong path and we need to get on a different path, which is the path that Obama has been talking about, leading to a nuclear weapons free world. The, the contrary view really comes out of the uh, nuclear weapons defense industry that has enormous investments uh, in these uh, in these weapons systems uh, so that there is a huge uh, a huge political pushback uh, on these issues uh, the the power of of the industrial uh, commitment to generating these weapons it's a very it's a very lucrative business uh, is is very much I think felt in Congress and that's where the people are really going to have to stand up and say no, you know, in spite of whatever may be somebody's corporate interest in, in developing nuclear weapons still, uh, we don't want these things. Part of the challenge right now is that the president, uh, I think, has been forced to make uh, perhaps some Faustian bargains uh, in relation to rebuilding the nuclear weapons complex uh, in hopes of gaining the kinds of votes. He needs at least uh, seven more votes than the Democrats can put together, at least seven Republican votes to get 67 votes in the Senate. And uh, that seems to be the rationale for uh, putting close to $100 billion into the budget for uh, uh, upgrading the, uh, the budgets uh, for the uh, nuclear uh, regulatory, uh, for the military nuclear uh, industry in the United States. For the labs and um, for new facilities, there's new facilities in the pipeline now for the nuclear weapons production. Uh, or, well, it's yeah, new pits, new plutonium pits. It's all about uh, supposedly keeping the nuclear uh, stockpile, you know, usable and reliable. Um, that we might have to replace parts of these nuclear weapons because they're getting old. And so, yes, billions of dollars in the pipeline now for new toys and new new plants and new facilities for the nuclear weapons complex. Clarify that pits. What are pits, pits. and how do they fit into this? A pit is, uh, is the plutonium core of a nuclear weapon. It's one of the most difficult things to create in, in any nuclear weapon. And that's... Um, something that needs to be renewed or, or replaced on a regular basis, correct? 
Incorrect. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I don't buy I personally do not buy that. No. Well, from the standpoint of the people that are pushing this the the nuclear weapons industry. The, the studies about the reliability of the of the pits and the warheads uh, have pretty consistently indicated that they have a very long shelf life. Uh, the argument that they have to be retested, they have to be remanufactured just hasn't hasn't held up uh, when the um, uh, the, the folks that didn't have a vested interest in the outcomes were taking a look at that. So, no, it's it's really, uh, it's making new nuclear weapons. And the, the, the scariest piece of this that we've discovered is at Los Alamos, the lab, uh, weapons lab in Los Alamos, they are building a new facility, uh, perhaps a $5 billion facility, that when it's up and running f uh, full steam, will be able to generate uh, about 125 new plutonium pits a year, so 125 new nuclear weapons a year uh, coming out of Los Alamos when this uh, new initiative, uh, you know, comes to, um, uh, you know, comes online. Well, and that seems to be part of the, the crux of the problem here. With It seems that with regardless of the number of treaties that get passed or the U.S. talks about or enters into, there's this constant move towards we need to update things. We need, you know, new pits. We need um, the next generation of nuclear warheads to be researched, and therefore we need the research facilities. You've got over at, at Bangor, they're in the process of trying to get a second weapons handling wharf, aren't they? To, That's very correct. expensive. So yeah. to be able to do twice as many missiles into the subs as they can now. Yeah, they, they claim that they need a new facility. Uh, it's an $800 million uh, facility uh, to continue to handle the loading and unloading of the nuclear mi nuclear missiles out of the Trident submarines. Um, it's it's a way of, of saying we're going to have these weapons indefinitely. Uh, another issue that's coming up probably within the next five years uh, is the beginning of the budget process for building the next generation of Trident submarines, which would be coming online around 2030. These uh, The submarines' uh, projected lifespan ends around 2030, so that they're going to be starting to look at the replacement of these of these warships uh, that cost well over a billion dollars a piece uh, and are uh, the most dangerous weapons ever built by humankind. A single Trident sub, fully loaded, has the capacity to uh, block out the sun in the entire hemisphere. It's just extraordinary that we would even consider doing such a thing, but that's where we go. The thinking from the Cold War continues, the Trident submarines continue to patrol at Cold War levels. They're out at the same rate, same time spans uh, on patrol in the Pacific and the Atlantic as they were uh, when we were facing the Soviet Union, although they've been shifted now where the majority of the patrols now are toward Asia and presumably China, which again seems bizarre given that China pr produces over half of our consumer goods and uh, holds over seven hundred billion dollars of our debt, and we're going to threaten them with with nuclear weapons. Just uh, within the last month, uh, there were three of the Trident subs that were surfaced in Asian ports, and people were uh, questioning, "What's the United States doing here, surfacing these weapons at China's front door?" If if uh, Congressman Norm Dix, Washington Sixth District, is listening. Congressman Dix, we've got to wean ourselves off of this federal spending on these investments that have no future. Um, I mean, <laughs> if we want to talk about where, where our tax money is going and, and how is this happening and how could we be investing like this, well, talk to Congressman Norm Dix, for one, among others. Um, it's time for us to build our economy around other things besides nuclear weapons and nuclear weapons production. You now the Greens have a saying, uh, no investment without a future. So it's time to stop. And, and the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, once it goes into effect, I think it will be a signal that we are ready to begin the process of ending this misadventure that we've been on. This raises a huge problem for the state of Washington in terms of, of converting from the military economy on which uh, much of our economy is based. 
uh, Kitsap County has well over half of its uh, entire economy uh, coming off of the Navy. Uh, the Banger Base brings three and a half billion dollars into the state of Washington every year. So if we're going to uh, try to transfer our investments in the human future, uh, we need to find ways to give these good folks jobs, the folks that are working uh, for the Navy. Uh, they need to be family wage jobs. And the question is, are we even beginning to think about that uh, as opposed to just continuing down this, this blind road? Um, hopefully, uh, we will begin to, uh, to think about this more constructively. Uh, this coming, this next weekend, the uh, August 6th, 7th, 8th, and 9th, uh, which is uh, the anniversary of the bombing of uh, Hiroshima on August 6th and Nagasaki on August 9th in 1945, the Ground Zero community uh, is is hosting a gathering uh, at our new park, uh, new house, uh, which is immediately uh, borders on the Banger Base. The backyard of the, the property is the barbed wire fence of the Banger Base. Uh, and we will be gathering Friday evening for people that want to tent camp uh, and Saturday and Sunday uh, having a, uh, a series of uh, gatherings and presentations, including talking about uh, converting uh, the economy from uh, the military economy to a civilian economy. Uh, so we'd love to have people come and join us. That's uh, the information accessible at gzcenter.org. All right, and then also, as we already stated, this next Tuesday there's a key vote coming up uh, in the Senate. It's in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. I'm not sure when the um, full Senate is going to vote on it. Probably, I would think within a month. Um, the full it's going to come before the full Senate. It's definitely going to be something to watch. Definitely something you could contact your senators about. If you have friends who live uh, in the um, in the red states, uh, you might want to contact them and ask them to, to urge their senators also to support the START Treaty. Um, and I wanted to mention a couple other websites, psr.org, good place to look for all things uh, to do with these sorts of issues. Um, and PSR and Washington PSR are both members of the Campaign for a Nuclear Weapons Free World, and that's nuclearweaponsfree.org. Very good. And the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, when is that coming up? Well, that's a tough one. Uh, when I was back in Washington, we were talking a lot about what were the potentialities of that. I mean, START is a tough one, getting the START treaty. Um, however, there's, there's such widespread support. I mean, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Secretary of Defense, everybody... It, it, I believe that they've got, a, you know, they've got enough support for that that they're going to be able to get the 67 votes. Although it won't be easy, the Tea Party's out against it. For for instance, um, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty will be tougher. Obama has uh, declared that it's, you know, he's going to make this happen while he's president. So I think it's, uh, it's, it's, I think it's better than a 50/50 chance that it'll come up before 2012. But it could, it could come up sooner. I, I don't know. I don't think it'll come up before this next election in November. It'll probably be after that sometime. But the sooner the better, in my opinion. The rest of the world is waiting. And of course, if some, some sort of horrific nuclear accident were to occur, uh, it could be all bets are off. So I say let's get on with it. Yeah, one of, one of the things that the movie, one of the points the movie makes is that if a nuclear weapon is ever used again uh, for whatever reason, uh, the kind of, of loss of civil liberties that we see with 9-11, the kind of the increase in the national security state and so on, it will be dwarfed by what will happen in response to a nuclear weapon going off because the, the carnage from a nuclear weapon will be a hundred times. 9-11. All right. Well, with that, we are unfortunately out of time. I want to thank you both for coming and spending time with us this morning. Thanks, Mike. Thank you.